Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Today's training focus is going to be kind of four things. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about just a few administrative items. I'll go through those as quick as I can so we can get to the good stuff. Uh, but for the most part, I do want to address a, a few administrative items that maybe you didn't know that you had access to or that you weren't sure how to access them. Okay, so I'll, I'll discuss those really quickly. The second thing we'll do is we will actually go through uh, our standard reports. Okay, so uh, we'll go through standard reports, how to use them. I'll discuss a few of our popular ones um, so that you can kind of be aware of what those are. Uh, but for, for the most part, I'll show you how to use those and how to schedule those. The third thing we'll do is we'll talk about Cradle to Grave and why it's such a powerful tool and how to use it. Uh, Cradle to Grave, weird name, fantastic tool. I will explain all of that a little bit later. And then the last thing we'll discuss is we're going to go through and discuss our recording library. Okay. Um, when we get to that point, if you do not have the recording library module, you do not have to feel obligated to stick around. Okay, so if we get to that point, and you're like, eh, I don't have recording library, I don't need to hear this. I take no personal offense if you decide to leave the, main, uh, the meeting at that point. Okay, so I'm going to go through it anyway. So if you want to stay on, great. If not, then don't worry about it. Like I said, I take no personal offense if you decide to leave at that point. Okay. Now, before we get into anything here, I want to discuss two things. The first thing I want to mention really quickly is this. After today's training, you may still have questions, right? Maybe you didn't feel comfortable asking your question, or maybe you think of something after the fact. If that is the case, I want to point your attention to what we refer to as our Zima Care site and our guide site. If I need help or if I have questions about anything after the training, if you go to our website, which is just zimasoftware.com, you'll come over here where it says support. If I click on support, that takes me to what we call our Zima Care page. Now, the Zima Care page is mostly or strictly about troubleshooting. If I'm having issues with Chronicle, if it's not running or if I run into an issue, then this is a great place to go. There's a lot of great information here. However, if you're just not sure how to use something or if you're looking for a certain aspect of Chronicle that you're just not sure where to find it, then what I would recommend is that you click on this documentation library option. The documentation library is a new feature that we have. It's something that we're, we've just recently put together and it's continuing to grow each day. But the idea basically with this is this is a how-to site. This is our user's guide site, if you will. So if you do have questions about anything, maybe today after the training you have questions about Cradle to Grave. If I come here and click on Cradle to Grave, there are some articles that will talk to you a little bit more about Cradle to Grave. If I wanna know what something means, I can click on terminology and that will allow me to see a list of what something means in, in Cradle to Grave. Okay. If I have questions about specific reports, if I come here and click on run report, and this is a, again, an ever growing, ever changing item. Um, so I, I like to say that it's organic. We have recently put a list of all of our standard reports here. Some of them we're still working on, but for the most part, what you'll have access to is if I have questions about a specific report, let's take for example, one of our most popular, the agent call summary. If I cl click on agent call summary over here to the right hand side, it gives me kind of an overview of what this report is used for. Point of interest, many companies want to see how many calls an agent has missed. This report provides a missed calls column, which is just right there. Okay. I can click on the picture. It shows me a little bit bigger what it is, what the report's going to look like, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, I get a description of what each one of those items mean. Okay. So this is a great resource. Uh, all of the reports, I will be honest with you, I'm still working on a lot of these, so I'm not, I don't have all of them done yet, but there is information about each one. I'm just giving you more information, and that's why I say that some of them are not done. So they, there is information for each one. I'm just giving you more. So that, that will take me just a little bit, but hopefully soon in the next, uh, next week or so that, that should be done. For the most part, this is a great location for you to go to find any questions or to answer any questions that you might have on how to use Chronicle. Okay. So I wanted to start there really quick just so you know that this exists. Okay. All right. Cool. Let's do this now. The other thing I want to talk about is how to access Chronicle. So this is the second thing I want to mention before we actually jump into Chronicle. There are two ways to do this. The first is once Chronicle has been installed on your network, I can access it from any computer on that network. The first way is through any web browser that supports Java. Now, if you are not sure which web browsers support Java, of course, when I'm talking about web browsers, if you're not familiar with that means, uh, most of you probably are, but if you're not, that's your Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Internet Explorer, uh, Opera, those types of things, Safari. If you are not sure which one of those supports Java, I'll make this really simple. There's actually only one, and that is Internet Explorer. 
So you can access Chronicle through Internet Explorer. I currently am using an Internet Explorer extension on my Google Chrome. So you can do that as well. Okay, so you can just download, just type in Internet Explorer extension for Chrome, something like that, and it will give you the option to do this. When I access Chronicle through that web browser, up here at the top where I have my URL, here is where I will uh, be able to access it by first typing in the IP address of the Chronicle server. Mine is, is a demonstration version of Chronicle I have here on my, dap, uh, my, last, my laptop, um, so it's going to say local host. That's my, my local IP address. Yours, however, most likely will not be local host. Yours will be the actual IP address of the Chronicle server. After I have that uh, typed in there, I'm gonna also follow that with exactly as I have here, colon 9080. That colon 9080 is what we refer to as an Apache Tomcat port. The only thing you need to know about that, you don't need to know about the background of those or anything like that. The only thing I need to know is I have to have that there or I cannot access Chronicle. This is the port that we use to access Chronicle through that web browser. So if I don't type in colon 9080 here, it won't take me anywhere. I have to have colon 9080 there, and then that takes me here to the Chronicle login page. Okay? That's way or option number one to access Chronicle. The second is actually what I would recommend. Once I'm here to the Chronicle login page through Internet Explorer, there's this little link here that says Chronicle Desktop. If I click on that, that takes me to a page where I can download the Chronicle desktop. An even easier way to do this, I'm gonna tell you to go against everything that I just told you not to do. If I open up Google Chrome and try to access Chronicle through Google Chrome. Okay, so I'll type in my, my IP address followed by colon 9080. If I try to do that here, guess what? It doesn't take me to Chronicle, but it takes me exactly to this same page. Okay, with one difference, that difference is telling you, hey, this is using Java that we can't use. So there you have it. But it's the same thing. Here is my Chronicle desktop download. Now, through this, I'll show you this really quick. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize my, my Chronicle there. Through this, when I do this download, I do recommend that everybody does this. Once I do this download, all I have to do is click on the, the option here, Windows or Mac, okay? And it will give me the option to download, um, in particular, two things. The first is what we refer to as Chronicle browserless. The second is the actual Chronicle desktop itself. Okay, so it will give you the option to download both. By default, it will download both. Here's why I might not want to download Chronicle browserless for an everyday user. I don't want them to access Chronicle, right? So if I want them to, if I don't want them to access Chronicle, I'm going to deselect the option to have Chronicle browserless installed. Well, then why would I do it for an everyday user at that point? Well, because you might want them to have the Chronicle desktop features. I will explain what those are in just a second here. But before we touch on that, let's really quickly just talk about Chronicle Browserless. The first thing it provides me is Browserless Chronicle, meaning I will be able to access Chronicle outside of a web browser. I won't have to use stupid Internet Explorer, right? If you're like me, I don't prefer, I don't prefer using the Internet Explorer. Um, I do occasionally for these purposes here, but for the most part, I don't like to. So I download the Chronicle Desktop so I can have access to that Chronicle, desktop, uh, Chronicle Browserless. I get asked a lot, what's the difference between browserless Chronicle and browser Chronicle? There's only one difference. One uses a browser, the other one does not. That's it. Everything else is the exact same. Features, functions, everything is the exact same. The only difference is one uses the browser, the other does not, okay? The other benefit to using Chronicle browserless is I don't have to continually update Java, at least not for Chronicle purposes, okay? So if you are accessing Chronicle, if that's part of your position, of course, that's probably why you're on here today. If you are accessing Chronicle, I do recommend using the Chronicle desktop. Okay, the Chron excuse me, the Chronicle browser list. Okay. Here's the second part, Chronicle desktop. What in the world does this provide? Well, it provides three things for everyone on here today. The first is an agent chat and file transfer tool. Looks kind of like this, right? So I can see my here, my good friend, Adam Jones. He's currently on a call. I know that because he's got an agent dashboard, but he's actually on this call with me here. So if I wanted to, and I don't know if he's, he's gonna be available to do this, but if I wanted to, I could double click on his profile and that would pop up with a box that I could then use to chat with him, okay? And not only can I use that to chat with him, I can also use it, oops, there it is, okay? I can also use it to send, uh, send um, files to him. Hey, Adam, okay? So if he's available and if he's able to respond, it would say Adam Jones is typing, okay? On, on top of that, as I mentioned, you can also use this as a file transfer tool. So if that's the case, I can just click and drag and drop that file and send that over to him and he'll be able to receive that. Everyone on here today has access to that feature. 
that is why you might want to install the Chronicle desktop on the desktop of the users. Okay. If you don't care about them having this chat tool, perfectly fine. You don't have to install this for any the Chronicle desktop for anybody except for yourself as the manager. Okay, and I'll show you a couple of the reasons why you as the manager might want this. But that's the main reason. If I have base license of Chronicle, I might want to install that Chronicle desktop on that user's computer if you want them to have access to this chat tool. Okay. So really quickly, I'm going to stop here for two seconds and just find out, are there any questions on this so far? Cool. All right, then let's go ahead. I'm going to move this over here just in case, just in case Adam does decide to respond. It will pop to the front of my screen, just FYI. Okay. All right. A couple other reasons why I might want this tool. For you as the manager, you also have access to what's called the Chronicle Heartbeat. The Chronicle Heartbeat alerts me to any time that there's an issue that interrupts the Chronicle service. So, for example, if Chronicle stops logging or if there is a um, a disk space issue, right? If Chronicle's about to run out, or your server is about to run out of space, you can have it send you a message. Or if there's a recording issue, if you've purchased the recording library, if there's a recording issue, again, same thing, this can send you a message to let you know that there's an issue. And it does that in three different ways. I can have a desktop screen pop, which I'll show you what that looks like in just a second here. So desktop screen pop, an email, and even a text message to let you know that there's an issue with Chronicle. Okay, I'll show you how to set that up today. Last but not least, Instant 911 notifications. Now, I personally like to change the name to this. It is called the Instant 911 notification. I personally like to call it the emergency or the alert call notification. And that's strictly because it's not limited to just 911. Now, I get questions occasionally uh, uh, from people asking, why would I use this? Well, not everyone will. Okay. Um, this is for if you as the manager or management team want to be alerted anytime someone in your office dials an emergency number. Now, by default, that will strictly mean 911. In fact, there's actually two numbers, 911 and 311. I'll explain that in just a second here. But you can set this up to actually alert you to any other number dialed. If I want to know if the security desk phone number is dialed, or if the president of the company's phone number is dialed, or if I know that one of my employees has been calling his or her girlfriend or boyfriend from their phone, right, and I know that they shouldn't be doing that, so I find out what that girlfriend or boyfriend's phone number is. So anytime that, that user dials that number, boom, this pops up on my screen. That's a little big, big brother-ish, right? But that's, that's entirely up to you. That is a use. Right, so this more than anything just alerts you to any time that a specific number that you wanted to be alerted to is dialed. Okay, and so you'll see it pop up on your screen like this. In order for me to get this screen pop, I do have to have that Chronicle desktop and I have to be logged into it. But it will pop up on my screen, it tells me who, so support voicemail, this is of course just a demo here, extension 290 at 1119 a.m., that switched just a second ago, uh, it's now 1120, but that is my time and it tells me which number was dialed who, when, and which number was dialed. So this just alerts me to any time that one of those emergency numbers is dialed. Okay? Like I said, you may or may not ever use this, but it is something that you can have access to. So again, this, this message is sent in the form of a desktop screen pop. Again, it can also be sent as an email, and once again, as a text message as well. The benefit of an email and a text message is I do not have to have access, and in fact, I don't have to be logged into, I should just, that's a better way to put it, I do not have to be logged into the Chronicle desktop to receive an email or a text message. Okay, so I'll show you how to set that up today. Before we move on here, are there any questions about that? Okay, <laughs> there's Adam right there. <laughs> You're so sweet, Adam, I love that, thank you. <laughs> okay, all right, uh, if there are no questions, then cool, let's get to the fun stuff. I'm gonna go actually ahead and, and close this here. And I've got a demonstration version of Chronicle that I have here installed on my computer. When I'm logging into Chronicle, um, most of you have probably already done this, but um, by default, you do have some default credentials. Capital A administrator is my username, and then lowercase password is my password. Now you can change that, and I 100% recommend that you do change that. So if you haven't done so already, really quickly, let's talk about how to do that. Before I jump in there, notice over here on the left-hand side, I'm going to have a list of the licenses of Chronicle that I have purchased. Now, I have a demonstration version, so it shows everything. You might be missing some of the ones that I have. That's perfectly fine. We will discuss the ones that you have for sure today. Okay. But before we get to those licenses, let's come down here where it says user management. There's three things I want to mention here really briefly. The first is this user accounts option. 
when I first access Chronicle, as I mentioned, I, I do recommend that you change that username and password. Uh, to do that, here under user accounts, right here where it says user slash new user, if I drop this box down, I'm going to take it down here where it says system administrator, and this is where I can change that username, and this is where I can change that password. Okay, so I do again recommend it. You don't have to necessarily change the, the username if you don't want to, but I do highly recommend changing that password. Okay, in addition to being able to change that username and password, you also have the option to create as many login accounts to Chronicle as you would like. So there's no extra cost with this. If I want every person in my company, I don't recommend this, but if you want every person in your company to have access to Chronicle, you could give them each an account. But as I'm creating those accounts, there's one thing I want to be aware of. Number one, of course, yes, I'm going to go through here and, and name this, right? Tammy, if you don't mind, I'm going to use your, you as the guinea pig here for just a second. Uh, I just put your name, and then, of course, I'd put in your uh, passwords. But from here, this is the one thing I want you to remember. You do have to assign the permissions to this user. And you have three options. Number one is administrator. Administrator, I think you guys get that. It means I can access everything. There's, there's no limits. Managers are really, really similar to administrators with one exception. Here in this admin system section, there will be limitations, in particular system settings. So manager accounts will not be able to change any administrative settings. Okay, so keep that in mind. But in regards to the licenses, those users that have that manager account will be able to access all of the licenses and everyone and everything within those licenses. Last is my favorite, and that's user. The reason why this is my favorite is because a lot of times, I'm going to come in here and click this button that says edit user access. Typically, when I'm creating an account for like a lower level management position, um, there's a good chance I don't want them to do everything. There are only certain things I want them to do. So with that being the case, this is where user accounts come in control. Because now I can come in here and decide what I want them to be able to do. Now I'm going to talk about three of these sections today. The first is cradle to grave. Within Cradle to Grave, right now, Tammy currently has full access, which means she can see everyone and everything. She can see every call and every detail of every, every single phone call. But guess what? Tammy is a manager over only one group. Not everybody, just, just one group. So I'm going to come in here where it says full access. I'll drop this down to partial access. And now I can go through and I can select who I want Tammy to be able to see within, user account, within her user account. I'm going to deselect everybody. And then I can go through and just say, okay, look, she is a manager over Alexandra and Brandon and uh, David. So I can go through here and select my list of users. What this means is that when she logs into her Chronicle account, she will only see phone calls related to these users within Cradle to Grave. So if she logs into Chronicle, goes into Cradle to Grave, she will only see phone calls involving these users. Um, if one of these users is not involved in a phone call, she will not see those phone calls. Forgive, forgive me as I'm going through this list of users to select in here. So this way, I know that when she gets into Chronicle, she's not seeing things she shouldn't. She should just see calls involving the users that report to her. Okay. Jumping over here to reporting, same concept. Put this down to partial access. Starting from the bottom this time, we can go through here and say, okay, Tammy is not over all groups. She's only over the appointments group. And within that appointments group, she's only over a handful of those users. So then I can go through here again and select the specific users. So now when she goes to run a report, she can only run it for, if it's a group report, only for the appointments group. And if it's a user report, only for the specific users that I've selected her for her to see. Okay. So if it doesn't involve one of those users, she won't see it. Now, here's where it gets a little bit overwhelming. You'll notice if I slide through this list here, there are over 50 reports that you have access to as part of the standard reports licensee, and even further if you have real time and recording. You have, I think there's a total of 63 if you have all of the modules of Chronicle. So at this point, I don't want her to see every report. I don't want to overwhelm her. So I'm going to go ahead and deselect this select all option. And I can say, okay, Tammy should only have access to the abandoned calls report, uh, the agent call summary report, and the agent outbound calls report. So that means when she logs into her account of Chronicle and she goes to reports, she will only see three reports. And with those reports, she can only run it for these individuals that I've selected. Okay. Uh, looks like there's a call release or a question here. 
what happens if a call for one of my people is transferred to someone I don't have cradle to grave permissions to listen to call? Can I still hear the portion of that call? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, are, are you talking about strictly just for recording, Michael? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. It, it depends on how your recording is set up. Um, if you are using our Vertex uh, option to do the recording, uh, essentially, unless that person, so let's say, for example, okay, you are using the Vertex, okay. Say, for example, I'm the user, right, and that call comes to me, um, and I transfer it to someone else, right? So my portion of the call will be recorded. If the person that I transfer to is not a negative recording, then that call should record straight to the end of recording. So you should be able to hear it. You should be able to hear the full recording. Unless, again, like I said, there was a negative rule set up that says do not record XYZ person. Okay. So you should be able to hear that recording through the end. Great question. That's a great question. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Michael, for, for, for doing that. Okay. Um, Last thing here with reports in the user accounts aspect. Uh, with that said, um, you have two things. You can schedule reports to run automatically, okay? If I want Tammy to be able to schedule reports, I would make sure that this box is selected. If not, I just deselect that. Furthermore, if I have the custom reports module, I can give her access to create reports. If I don't want it to, again, same thing, I just deselect that option. If I don't have custom reports, then that doesn't matter either way. Okay, so that re create reports will only apply if I have uh, custom reports. Okay, last one here and then we'll move on. Now we have recording. Recording is kind of one of those um, uh, interesting things. For those of you that had a recording library, there's two things to, to be aware of that it does. Number one thing that it does is it will uh, essentially, uh, when a call is recorded, our recording library compresses that recording down to what we call a .spx file. Okay, that .spx file essentially is just a smaller version of a recording, so therefore it's not taking up as much space. The second thing that it does is once a call is recorded, it'll automatically be made available in Cradle to Grave. So you can access that recording directly through the Cradle to Grave interface. Therefore, if a recording does not involve one of my users, and I don't want Tammy to listen to it, I need to come in here and tell it what I want, tell it what I want uh, Tammy to have access to with that recording. Okay. So if a call, uh, like I said, involves one of my users, I should have access to that recording. Now with this, here I have three options. I have listening, downloading, which actually counts as two things, downloading slash emailing and deleting. Here I see a list of much shorter uh, proportions, right? And that's again, because keep in mind, I've only given Tammy access to these users within Cradle to Grave. So when she gets in there, that would stand to reason that she should only be able to access recordings, again, involving these users, okay? So at this point, uh, what will happen is on listening, I can go through and say, okay, I want her to be able to listen to recordings for all of these individuals. Maybe there's someone I don't want her to listen to. So I'll go ahead and, for example, just deselect Philip Johnson. Okay, I don't want her to listen to recordings for Philip Johnson. Okay, so at this point, once I hit okay, she can listen to recordings for everyone in her, in her group except for Philip Johnson. Next, we move over to downloading, downloading which again counts as two things, downloading, downloading slash emailing. You'll notice here, Philip no longer uh, is presented in this list. So at this point, if I don't want her to be able to download or email recordings, again, I just deselect everybody. If I want her to, except for a couple people, then I can, of course, again, I can go through and deselect the ones that I don't want her to be able to, to record or to download or email for, okay? I'm just gonna go ahead and deselect everybody. I don't want her to download or email recordings. And then deleting, deleting is the big one, of course. By default, if I don't go through and do this, guys, if I give someone access to Chronicle and I don't come in here and set up their user account, then at this point, they will automatically have access, or by default, they will have access to delete recordings. I don't want that to happen. So again, I come in here under deleting and deselect everybody. That means she cannot delete recordings for anyone. Okay. So that is how you create a user account. I'm not gonna spend any time on real time. Chats is, uh, Chats actually has to do with this chat tool, okay, in particular for the internal chat. If I want someone to have access to that chat, uh, I can give them access to it. What that basically means is you can see those chat messages in Cradle to Grave. So any, any chat message that my users are involved with, if it's someone that I can see in Cradle to Grave, I will also be able to see their chat messages if they, if they are using this chat tool, okay? So you will be able to have a record or history of that. Okay, any questions before we move on here? Or any other questions? How okay, long uh, yeah. does the recording stay in the system? 
That's a great question. Um, by default, indefinitely until your, your set server runs out of space, okay? Um, but you do have the ability to uh, create essentially a, a, a pool. Let me kind of show you what I mean by that. Here in admin system, under system settings, you actually have the ability to define how long you want Chronicle to hold on to those recordings. We didn't do this by default because every industry is different. For example, if any of you are in the insurance industry, um, I heard recently from someone that they had to keep recordings for up to seven years, right? So we didn't put this up or set this up by default simply because each industry is different. But if I do want to be able to go in there and create what we refer to as a retention policy, um, in other words, how long I want Chronicle to keep those recordings, I can come in here under the recording library section of system settings where it says recording libraries. Mine currently just says one recording library. You might have more. Um, so you'll kind of have to do this for each one of those. But I would select my recording library, hit edit, and then from here where it says recording storage location, configure drive pooling. I open this up. Now, I don't actually have recording library set up in my, in my demo here, but what would happen is this box would open up and it would show me where those are being stored. Again, I don't actually have one running because this isn't actually connected to a phone system, but I would see where they're being stored. Of course, you can change that. And right here where it says retention policies, if I check this box, it says delete old recordings to make room for new recordings. I now can go through and say, okay, never delete recordings newer than, if I were in the insurance industry, seven years. Okay, and then I can say delete recordings older than, again, same thing, seven years. Okay, so you can do that by days, months, or years. But, but that way, um, you can tell Chronicle what to keep and what to get rid of. Okay, now when, just be aware, when it does purge those old recordings, it does get rid of the recordings. They're no longer accessible, unless you've downloaded it and saved it somewhere else, but you would have to do that manually. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, let me know. But are there any other further questions about that? Okay, fantastic. All right, great questions, guys. Okay, uh, just a few more administrative items. Uh, like I said, I'll try to go through this as quick as I can. It, the user management section is kind of where we spend the most time because that is one, um, if you are the administrator for your account, uh, then we want to make sure that you kind of understand how to do some of those things. So we've talked about creating accounts. One of the other things we can do is refer is what we refer to as create a user role. Now, when I'm using Chronicle, uh, Chronicle reports, or you can report within Chronicle on individual users. We call them agents. You can also report on your hunt groups or work groups, whatever you prefer to call them. You can report on inbound calls, outbound calls. You can report on phone numbers, things like that, right? So when we get into reports, you'll see there's a whole slew, a whole list of options for you to choose from. Um, we've given you this option to create what we refer to as a Chronicle role. Essentially, a Chronicle role is a Chronicle created group. Now, uh, that, of course, that is separate from your phone system group. Now, the reason I might create this, let's say, for example, I'm Tammy right? And in Tammy's appointments group, not everyone in that appointments group reports to her, just a team. There's a handful of people from that team that report to her. So when she goes to run a report, she doesn't want to run it on the entire appointments team. I haven't given her permission to see the entire appointments team. So to make it easier on her, I'm going to create what we refer to as a Chronicle role. That means I can come in here and say, okay, create role. Let's say Tammy uh, has a team called Tammy's team. Tammy's team. Okay. From here, what this means is I can now go through and say, here are the users that report to her. So I'm going to go ahead and select this little person image here. This will pops up with a list of all of my users. So now I can go through here and select those users that report to her. So give me just a second here as I kind of walk through to do this. Um, in fact, I don't want to use Cody. I want to use David instead. Um, this is just a list of users that I use on a regular basis to kind of illustrate this purpose or this, this, uh, this uh, option. So you don't have to use these, but it just helps make it easier. When I'm selecting a handful of users, I don't want to have to go through, especially if I'm running this report for multiple people or for multiple different teams, I don't want to have to select each individual user, then deselect them, and then select for the next team each of the individual users, and then deselect them. It's just kind of problematic. So I can go through here, like I said, and create my own list of users, right? So at this point, after I select those users, I hit apply, I can see now that I have 10 users that are assigned essentially to Tammy's team. Well, where does this take effect? Well, once I create that, it actually populates throughout Chronicle. The nice thing about that is this, and we'll talk about how to do this in just a little bit here. You can schedule a report to run on a regular basis, hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, okay? 
if I decide to add someone new to that team, right? Let's say, for example, I've got a scheduled report to look at the appointment, uh, Tammy's team, and um, I add someone new to her team. I do not have to delete that scheduled report and start over again. All I have to do is add that person to Tammy's team. And if I've already got that report looking at Tammy's team, that new person I've just added will automatically populate. All I had to do was add that under here where it says user roles. Okay. I don't know if that makes any sense. Hopefully it does. But let me kind of show you what's going to happen here. So I'm going to click on run report. This takes me to my list of reports. Let's come to one of our popular reports. That's the agent call summary. I'll explain how to use this in just a minute here. But to run the report, I have to answer some questions right down here in the bottom right hand corner. We call this our report runner window. Um, we also might uh, sometimes refer to it as parameters. Okay, essentially parameters are questions that we're going to answer to run this report. So here, this is an agent report, says it right in the name. Agent, again, just is just a reminder is users, or you might call them extensions, depending on your phone system. Okay. But here where it says Rose Agent, I can open this up and say, you know what, I don't want to run this on appointment team one, which is what I ran it on last time. Now I want to report it or run it on Tammy's team. You'll notice there, Tammy's team is now there for me to use. So once I create it under user roles or Chronicle user roles, it will now populate throughout Chronicle. Once I select Tammy's team here and hit OK, when I run this report, it will feature those 10 users. So I will see a list of 10 users here. I'll recognize those names and it will show me the, the statistics for those users. Okay. So user roles, like I said, is kind of a way to create a Chronicle group that's separate from your phone system group. Okay. Any questions there? Okay. Perfect. Um, one really quick other thing here under user management, and that's this refresh users and groups. So I'm going to go ahead and click on mine really quick here so you can see this. Now, again, keep in mind, mine is not connected to a live phone system, so this might take a little bit longer than yours. But here's one of the things that we have happen on a regular basis. Um, in our support staff, we have people that call in and say, hey, I just add someone, added someone new to my phone system and they're not appearing in Chronicle. When Chronicle was first installed, it automatically pulled over from your phone system every existing username, extension, and group that existed in that phone system. Automatically pulled that over for you. But after Chronicle is installed, when you make those changes, when you make any changes in regards to groups or users, extensions, then Chronicle does not automatically know that those changes are made. So you'll need to come in here and tell Chronicle that those changes were made. Now, mine took a lot longer than yours will. It didn't take that long, but it took a lot longer than yours will. All you have to do is hit refresh users and groups. And then from there, once that's done, it will say, please restart your browser for changes to take effect. That basically just means log out and log back in. What that did is it syncs Chronicle to your phone system. So any changes that were made in that phone system should now be pulled over into Chronicle. Okay, so if you're running to that experience, just remember that. If I make changes in the phone system, you'll have to come into Chronicle and hit refresh users and groups. Okay, because it's not going to automatically know when those changes were made. Okay. All right. One last thing before we jump into reports further. Let's talk about how to create that, uh, that alert really quickly here. Uh, if I can remember my stuff there, there we go, right there. So here's my alert. I want to change, or I want to make sure that this, this pops up when someone dials uh, an emergency number. So how do I do that? Well, the first thing I need to do is I need to tell Chronicle what I consider to be an emergency number. Yours might be just fine. You might just be perfectly fine with the 911 and 311. Let me kind of show you what I mean by that. If I come in here where it says admin system, go to system settings. Under basic settings, we have an option called emergency numbers. This is where I get to tell Chronicle what I consider to be an emergency number. Currently, it tells me that there are four numbers in there. I'm going to open these up. We can see 311, 911. I've already mentioned those. Then we also have 9311 and 9911. That's just depending on if I have to dial 9 to get out of my office, right? For, sure, for, uh, for an outbound call. Well, guess what? Most likely, I'm never going to use 311. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and delete that. But maybe I do have a security desk phone number that I want to put in there. So I type that in there. Okay, so you can put any number in here that you consider to be an alert or an emergency number. Anytime you want it to be alerted, if, if a certain number is dialed, plug that in here into the, the emergency numbers. Okay, once I've done that, I hit OK, and then I hit Save, and then from there, now I get to go set up what I want that, uh, what, what kind of message I want. And that's going to be done, again, under Admin System, under Alerts and Triggers. Now, today we're going to focus on the standard triggers. Now, by default, all of you will have at least these three, emergency call, logging issue, and disk space issue. 
A couple of you, uh, if you have recording library, you should also see recording issue and insufficient recording ports. Now I'm only going to show you how to create emergency call today. And the reason being is because if I click on this click to show section for each one of these, it's the exact same. Okay. So by showing you how to create emergency call notifications like this one here, it shows you how to do all of them. So to start off with, let's let's do this one here. How do I want this? Uh, who do I want this to pop up for? Well, first let's come here where it says desktop notification. And I will come in here and select the list of those users. Typically speaking, that's not going to be my everyday users. Typically speaking, that's like a management team, right? So I will select the management team or whoever it is I want this to go to, whatever you prefer to do. Once I've selected them, I can hit OK. Now, keep in mind, one more time, in order for them to receive this message, they do have to have access to that Chronicle desktop and they do have to be logged into it. Else they will not receive those desktop screen pops. Okay. However, there's a second option, which is email. If I want this to go to my email, I just type my email in here. Okay. The nice thing about this is if I want this to go to multiple people, I just put a comma and send it to the next person. Put their email in here as well. Now there's a third option, which is text messages. If I want this to be sent as a text message, I'm going to stay here in this email line. I'll put another comma. But then I need to find out for whoever I want this to go to, I need to find out what is their cell phone service provider's text message gateway. Once I know what the gateway is, I can come in here and plug that in. So for example, here in the States, I go through a company called Verizon. Right? If, if you're in the States, you're, you're familiar with them. I got into Google and I said, hey Google, what's Verizon's text message gateway? And it tells me that it's my number followed by at vtext.com. Okay, really simple. If you go through Verizon, there you have it. Your, your phone number followed by at vtext.com. Each cell phone service provider throughout the world has their own text message gateway. You plug that in here, again, just put a comma after each one, and essentially it's, it's an email, but it's sent as a text message. Okay, from there I hit save, and then you're good to go. And that's how I set up all of those. Okay. Any questions there? Okay, cool. Well then, let's get to the fun stuff. Let's go back to those reports. Okay, so one more time to access those reports, all I have to do is come under here where it says reports and hit run report. And that will take me uh, to my, my standard reports section. Now, with the standard reports, um, this can be somewhat overwhelming, okay? Um, but before you jump in here and just start trying to run a report, the one thing I would recommend first is kind of have an idea in mind of what kind of reports you would want to see. Are they group reports? Are they individual user reports? Are they inbound call reports? Are they outbound call reports? What is it that you want to see? And the reason I bring that up is because here in this search bar, rather than just kind of cycling through this list here, now you can do that, I don't care, it doesn't bother me, but if I have an idea of what it is I want to see, maybe I want to see a group report. So I'm going to type in the word group here. And you'll notice here it narrows that down for me. Okay, maybe it's agent, same thing. Okay, uh, there we go, okay, does the same thing. So if there's a specific kind of report that I'm looking for, a specific kind of call, just type that in here, and it will show you in your list of options what those are, okay? You can also use filter tags. Filter tags are essentially the same thing, only it's giving you a category to select from. Maybe I wanna see my agent reports. There they are right there. I typed in agent already, but now if I just click on agent, it shows me these, okay? Group reports, there you go. All right. So you have these, these tags that you can use um, to help you find those reports, but Here's the best part about looking uh, at our reports. The first thing is this, you'll notice, as I click on a call in the list, over here to the right-hand side, I get kind of a preview or almost like a sample of what that report might look like. Now that's a great feature, and the reason why is because it shows me the column headers. The column headers are the main purpose as to why we give you an example of the report. Don't pay attention to the information, right? If I click on the abandoned calls report in this list and I start looking at the information, first of all, okay, final group, Pellentesk, not one of my groups, Placerat, Fossibus, Vel, Portator. It starts looking at, like a Game of Thrones abandoned calls report, right? So uh, at this point, keep in mind, this is just filler information until I run the report. What you should be paying attention to are the column headers because that is what will be accurate, okay? So abandoned calls, extremely popular report. People love to know how many calls are being abandoned. Let's break this down for you. What, what is an abandoned call? 
Again, this is something we get questions about a lot. In fact, we do have an article about this that explains this in detail on that guide site that I showed you a little bit earlier. The question we get most often is, what's the difference between a missed call and an abandoned call? Really quickly, a missed call is any call that comes to my extension or rings to my extension, and I don't answer it. Okay, That's going to be counted as a missed call for me. Now, an abandoned call, an abandoned call is any call that does not end in talking or a voicemail. So if that ends in something like queue, right? If I'm sitting in that queue and I get sick of waiting, I hang up, boom, that's an abandoned call. Or maybe it's on hold. If I'm sitting on hold and I get sick of waiting, so I hang up, boom, again, abandoned call. It can also be a call that ends in a ringing event. Now, ringing events are kind of interesting. Ringing events will actually count as two things. If the call ends in a ringing event, number one, it will count as a missed call because it rang to my extension and I didn't answer it but it will also count as an abandoned call because guess what? It did not end in a talking or a voicemail event, okay? So just remember, abandoned calls, if it, wasn't if it didn't end in talking or voicemail, it will be considered an abandoned call. Now, one last thing with abandoned calls, abandoned calls can be calls that at one point were answered. Weird, I know, but let me kind of give you a scenario here. Let's say, for example, you call in here to our office and Adam answers. And when he answers, you say, hey, Adam, I need to ask you a question. And he says, hey, can you hold on for just a second? So you say, sure. So he puts you on hold. A minute passes, three minutes pass, 10 minutes pass. You get sick waiting, so you hang up. So that call will count as answered because Adam answered that call. But it'll count as abandoned again because you hung up in something other than a talking event or a voicemail event. Okay? So that is what an abandoned call is. This report is extremely popular. People love to see how many calls are being abandoned. Now, we'll use this report in just a little bit here. We'll run it, and we'll kind of take a look at a couple, look at a couple things in regards to cradle to grave. But I wanted to explain that really quick because, like I said, we do get a lot of questions about that. Okay. Let's jump back here to this agent call summary really quickly here. This report is great because a lot of people do want to know, hey, how many calls are my users missing? The agent call summary has a column called Miss Calls. So we'll show you how many calls they miss. Another one, agent inbound calls. Okay, agent inbound calls, show me if the call was answered. That's another one that will show me if calls were missed. Agent inbound calls, this report shows me one call per each line. So each line that you see on the report is a call, so I can see finite details about those calls. Oh, and, uh, uh, yes, sounds like there's a question. Yes, I'm, Blake, I'm just wondering if on these reports, are you able to customize them at all like can you delete columns or are these canned reports that are are what they are great question yeah so what we're looking at right now are canned reports so they are what they are but if you have our custom reports module you can do whatever you want with these reports if there's a specific column that you don't like or if you want to change the meaning to something that's on here then with custom reports you do have the option to do that okay but but as they are right now these are canned reports what you see is what you get Great, great question. Okay, um, I'll, let me show you just one last report, and um, this is another really, a really big one. Like I said, we do have group reports, we have inbound call reports, outbound call reports. One of our other popular reports is what we call the inbound call performance. The inbound call performance report is a great report because it allows us to see how we're performing during certain periods of time. Now, this can be, uh, as the report says here, hours of day. Like I said, don't pay attention to this because this is just filler information, but we can do hours of day, we can do minutes of hour, days of week, days of year. So if you want to see, hey, how are we performing during certain time intervals, this is a fantastic report. So this report would say, hey, from the hours of one a, uh, midnight to 1 a.m., this is how many calls were presented, answered, abandoned, and so forth. Okay. Um, even things like, hey, calls were, how many calls were answered within 10 seconds, 15 seconds. So if you have like a service level agreement, this is a great, a great report for that purpose. Okay. So we've tr tried to cover all of our bases here. Um, you know, if you need more flexibility, of course, there is the custom reports module that you can purchase if you have not done so already. Uh, but for the most part, we, like I said, we've tried to cover all of our bases here with some of our reports or with most of our reports. Okay. So those are just a couple I would recommend. Again, that's the inbound call performance, uh, the agent inbound calls, uh, which is up here a little bit more right there. We have the agent call summary, and of course, also the abandoned calls report. Okay, so those are just a couple that we that we recommend as popular reports, if you will, at times. Okay, so let's talk about how to run a report. Really, really simple to do. 
Um, every report will have down here in the bottom right-hand corner what we refer to as the report runner window. The report runner window, again, houses those questions or those parameters of what you're going to use to run the report. So right here, the first question to always ask is, what report time frame do you want to see? Now, this is really cool, um, and this is actually one of the things that, again, kind of separates Chronicle from other softwares out there. We have the ability to go back and report on any time when Chronicle was installed. So I know for a lot of you, Chronicle is really new, but there might be some of you on here who have had Chronicle for a while. I know people, have, I've had people on my training sessions before that have had Chronicle for three years. Can I go back and run a report from three years ago? Yeah, if it was a time when Chronicle was installed, absolutely. Okay, so if it was a time when Chronicle was installed, I can run the report for that time, okay? And I can do, I almost went to the future there. <laughs> we cannot run reports on the future. Okay, um, with these, you can, you can run them for any amount of time that you'd like. Maybe I wanna do it for a day, okay? Or maybe the, the entire week, or maybe the entire month. All I have to do is select the first day and then the last day in the time frame, and it will highlight everything in between. Maybe I don't want it to highlight everything in between. Here's an advanced option. Advanced option gives me a little bit more flexibility with those time schedules. Maybe I don't want to run it for 24 hours. By default, Chronicle looks at 24 hours a day. Maybe I don't want it to. So if I open this up, I can say, look, just run it from my business hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Or maybe I just want to see it for a couple hours. Look, I want to see it from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Okay, so you can have a little bit more flexibility there. The other thing I like to point out here is days of week. Maybe I just want to see every Monday and every Wednesday. So if I come in here where it says days of week, I can go through here and say uh, Mondays and Wednesdays. And we'll only run it for those two days. Okay, I might have everything selected there, right? I might have every day selected for the month. I mean, I just, I just want to see the Mondays and Wednesdays of every month or of that month. So then again, I can go back into advance, select days of week and select Monday and Wednesday and we'll just look at Mondays and Wednesdays. So my point is you have a lot of flexibility here with your time schedules or your time frames. Okay. Let's go back and run this for uh, the 10th, which was yesterday. Uh, I'll go ahead and select OK here. And again, as I mentioned, this is an agent report. Therefore, I need to select which agents, again, the AKA users or extensions. Um, I, I wanna select the users that I want to feature on this report. Now, I created earlier Tammy's team. So I'm gonna go ahead and select Tammy's team. But I can also do this by individual users. If I want to go through that list and say, okay, these are the people that belong to Tammy's team. If I, had I not created that role, then I could come in here to users and say, okay, Alexandra, Brandon Carpenter, and so forth. Okay, but we're just gonna go ahead and leave Tammy's team selected there and hit okay. I also have the option to add charts. Charts are essentially just graphs. If I wanna see visual representation of those columns through a graph, I can. So here I have a line chart showing or showcasing total calls. Answered calls is represented by a pie chart and missed calls is, is represented by a bar chart. I can also arrange these however I want. Maybe I want my line chart to be my focal point. So that's, up, of course, up to you. You don't have to use those if you don't want to. You have it. Now, from here, we jump down here where it says PDF. There are actually four formats that I can use to run this report. PDF and HTML are most popular, but you can also use them as an Excel spreadsheet for further manipulation of the information. And, of course, you can also do a CSV or comma-separated value. But we'll go ahead and stick with PDF and then hit Run Report. That's it. I answer a few questions. And at that point, the Chronicle uh, will go through then and run my report based upon the information that I've selected. Now, depending on how much time, this is my demo here. So like I said, it's not connected to a live phone system. It might take just a second here. But for the most part, uh, it should be fairly quick. Again, of course, depending on the amount of time that you selected uh, that you want to see on that report. Okay. So here's my report. I'm going to go ahead and zoom out just a little bit here, uh, make it a little bit easier to see. Up here, we have kind of an overall summary. I prefer sometimes to refer to that as like the group summary. And then of course we have it broken, and I'll explain why in just a minute, but we have this broken down by individual users so we can see how many calls that they were involved with. Okay, and then of course, as I mentioned, we also have our charts down here. So I've got my missed calls chart here. It looks like, and it's kind of hard to see, but it looks like Jen and Bailey had the most calls missed, probably around 22, 23. Um, if we come back up here, we see Jen and Bailey missed calls, 23 right there. So she missed the most. Okay, it's really pretty simple to run. Now, the reason I run this report in particular, number one, again, because it is most, one of the most popular. Number two, there's one other thing I want to explain really quickly, and that has to do with total inbound calls. Okay. 
this is another situation we get calls for, uh, for which we get calls, I should say, on a, on a fairly regular basis. We're trying to provide better documentation so that this makes more sense. Um, here's one thing I want you to keep in mind. Again, as I mentioned, this is kind of like the group overall summary, right? So right here we see total inbound calls. It says 367. Great. What happens occasionally is people will start looking at those numbers and then they'll add all of these inbound calls up for each of the users. And sometimes that number together combined does not match total inbound calls here. Okay. In fact, it's usually higher than, than what you see here in total inbound calls. Now people call into us and say, holy cow, there's something way wrong with my report. I'm here to tell you there's actually nothing wrong with your report. It's actually, it's actually true. And here's, here's why I say that. As I mentioned, I want you to mention or kind of picture this as the group summary, right? So let's take, for example, total inbound calls. Let's say one call came in for the day. Okay, let's just pretend there's a one right there. If we look down here at the users now, let's say, for example, that call came in and it first went to Alexandra Burns. So it rang to her. Let's say she misses that call. And depending on how I have my call flow pattern set up, maybe that call then next rings to Brandon Carpenter. He misses it. David Green, he misses it. Erica Owens, she's the, she, she's the shining armor here. She's the one that goes and answers that call. So that call was answered by Erica Owens. But what you would see here is you would see that each four of those, all four of those users, Alexandra Burns, was she presented an inbound call? Yes. Brandon Carpenter, was he presented an inbound call? Yes. Same thing with David Green and with Erica Owens. So all four of them received an inbound call, albeit it was only one phone call. Okay, Chronicle is very literal. It is seeing that one phone call to the group was shared between those four users. Each one of those users received that call, but they, those first three missed it. So what you would see over here then is you would see under missed calls, you would see one, one, and one. So three missed calls essentially. Okay, and then the answered calls next to Erica Owens, it would say one answered call. Okay, so I, I, wanna throw, I wanted to throw that clarification because again, like I said, we do get calls about that frequently. Um, we don't want people to freak out thinking, holy crap, or, or, excuse my language, holy goodness, the, the report is way off, right? It's not, it's actually true. It's telling you the truth. It's just, they're two, it's looking at two different things. This is looking at the group. This is looking at the individual users, okay? Any questions there? There's one last thing. Uh, 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 yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> if you want to look at manned time, I, and you may have a different definition of that, but like the amount of time a staff is actually logged in taking calls, uh -huh. what is, where do you find that? Yeah, so there's a couple ways that you can find that. Um, the first question I have is, do you have, uh, do you have our um, real-time module? Do you know? Yes. Okay, cool. So if you have the real-time module, this is one that I would recommend using the agent real-time feature trace. Um, it shows you how long they're logged in. So you can see here where it says, um, you know, feature time log. Well, actually, it would act this one's actually kind of a logged out. Um, oops. Um, there's actually, let's do this one right here. Come on. There we go. Okay. Performance summary. So um, this report here, right here where mine says total duration, I would tell it, I would need to tell this, I want to run a report to show me how long someone was logged into their group, right? So here where it says group, I would select the group or groups, and then from there I would select feature duration. And feature duration allows me to say things like um, group login, okay, or extension login. And what would happen is if I selected both extension login and group login, it would actually provide two columns on the report, one for group login and one for extension login. And it would show me their total duration logged in to, to both the group and the extension. So this, this is the report I would recommend that you use. Okay. okay. Does that answer your question for you? Yes. Okay, perfect. Great. Any, any other questions? Is there any, sorry, I don't mean to be You're fine. You're here, fine. but is there any way, like, so, um, like, if we were to kind of tell somebody, these are the most important things for us, mm -hmm. um, we, what report would I get most of those features from? You know, like, so I'm looking at, I want to look at call lengths, I want to look at volume of calls answered, um, calls abandoned, calls missed. Um, and I'd like to get that, as much of that, in one report. Is there a way to kind of try to find that out? Like what yeah, report so, encompass most of those elements? 
Yeah, so um, let me do this really quickly here. Um, we kind of have two. So it kind of depends on how you want to look at it. Um, you could do group summary by agent, for example. So I can see agent. I can see if, and this is in particular if I have multiple or users that are part of multiple um, multiple groups. So I can see here agent number one. So I would select the agents that I would want to see here. It would show me the agent. And then for the group or groups that they're part of, I can see how many calls were presented, how many were answered, how many were missed, what their average speed of answer was, um, their login time, their logout time, that, that kind of information here. So this, this is probably, yeah, that, I would say this one, um, I'm trying to remember, agent summary by group is another one. Oops, if I can spell. Of course, my computer likes to give me a delay here. Oh my goodness. It's because you're all watching me type. Okay, so agent summary by group is another one. So you could look at the group and then just, it would show you each of the individual users for that group. So it kind of just depends on how you'd want to see it. Group summary by agent will show you kind of each agent in their own little kind of mini report. So it's a agent one and then show the details for their groups that they're part of. Whereas this one's kind of the opposite. It will show you the group and then each of the users that belong to that group and then their specific statistics. Okay. 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 So I, I would probably recommend the other one over this one, but that of, of course is entirely up to you. Okay. Okay. Great question. Yes. I, I, I hope that helps. I hope that helps. But, uh, it does. Okay, good. Yeah, one more time. Uh, that's the group summary by agent. Um, so, great question. Any other questions before we move on here? Okay, perfect. Well, guys, there's one last thing I want to talk about with reports, um, and that is how to schedule a report. Um, it's actually really simple to do. Um, and and, and as, I, as I previously mentioned, um, here's another, uh, you mentioned call volume. So here's agent call volume. So you can see different times of the day what their call volume was, right? <laughs> so that's just another one I heard you say that. But moving up one report, um, we'll go back to that agent call summary. I want to schedule this report maybe weekly or monthly, right? This is all, of course, up to you. But if I want to schedule this report to run automatically, all I have to do is right click on that report and go to schedule report, okay? When I get to schedule report, I choose what I want to call this. So again, Tammy, I'm gonna just keep in use, using you here if that's okay. Tammy's, uh, let's call this Tammy's monthly agent call summary, okay? From here, I get to decide how I want that sent to me. Now I can have it emailed, which of course is by far the most popular. I can have it saved to a server directory, which is probably the least popular. <laughs> of course, there's printing. Uh, I can do all three if I'd like. Focusing on the email, because like I said, that's probably the most popular here. If I select email to the following address or addresses, again, same thing uh, as kind of like setting up that alerts and triggers, I would come in here and type in the email. If I want this to go to multiple people, I just put a comma, just like this, okay? So then I can set up, and I have had the question before, is like, what if I have you know, a handful of people under one email? So for example, maybe I have a sales group. And, and I call them sell, they have an email called sales at email.com. Can I put that in here when it said to all of them? Yeah, if it's, if it's part of the list, right? If, if that person is on the list under that sales, dot, or sales at email.com, if I send, send that to sales at email.com, anybody who's part of that is going to receive that email. Okay. Um, down here, format, and then I hit next. Now this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. It's gonna want to know, hey, when do you, run, when do you want to run this report for the first time? So I'm gonna go ahead and set click to define. And from here, I need to make a decision. Before I select my delivery date, I need to decide how frequently do I want this report? Do I want it daily? Do I want it hourly, monthly, weekly? What do I want? Well, let's say, for example, I want this report as a monthly report. I'm going to have it send on the last day of the month, the 30th, and I'm going to have that send at 11, of course, that's military time or universal time. 11.59.59, so right before midnight, right before it strikes October 1st, I want this report to run, okay? So I select my run time, or run, my run date, and my run time. From there, I'll show you what I'm doing, why I do that in just a second here. I want this to go ahead and be, like I said, I can do it hourly, daily, day of week. Here's the difference between daily and day of week. Daily is every day or every two days, every three days, whatever my preference. Whereas day of week says, look, I'm not here Sunday or Saturday. I don't want that report to run Sunday or Saturday. I just want to run Monday through Friday. Okay, so that's of course entirely up to you. I'm gonna go ahead and say monthly. And this gives me two options where it says monthly by date, uh, which basically means report will be delivered on the last day of the month, okay? Or by day of week, report will be delivered on the last Sunday of the month. So that's of course, again, up to you. 
most often it's done by date, which is again, here I've got it the last day of the month. If I selected October 1st, it would say the first day of the month. If, it, if my month ends on the 15th, it would say on the 15th of the month, right? So you, you, that'll change based upon what you select. I can select months if I want to. Maybe I don't want it to run month, uh, every single month. Maybe there are only specific months. Okay, so whatever. Maybe you do this quarterly. I don't know, something like that. But then I can go ahead and hit next. And now it's going to say, okay, Blake, you've got this scheduled to run on Sunday, September 30th at 1159 p.m. What do you want on there? So this is where I, this is probably the most important part of this, where it says report time frame. I'm going to open this up. I've got this scheduled to run on the 30th. This is a monthly report. That means I want the month of information on there. So I'm going to go ahead and select the first through the 30th, just like that. Okay. That means on the 30th at 1159.59, I'm going to get a report covering the entire month of September. Now, once that report scheduler runs, it's intuitive. It knows it's not just a one-time thing. It then will move to October 31st. And on the 31st, I'm going to get at 1159.59, I'm going to get a report covering the 1st through the 31st of October. It then moves to November, does the same thing. So it continues that pattern. All I have to do is set it once here with the pattern essentially that I want. So again, the first to the last of the month, hit OK. And like I said, from this point on, after I select my users, after I select my charts, I hit finish. And that report will now be set up to run every month on the last day of the month at 1159.59. And it will cover that entire month. Okay. If I ever need to make changes to that, I come back up uh, uh, back to the report section here, go under here where it says schedule report. You will see there's Tammy's a monthly ACS. And with that, if I want to edit something on there, maybe I want to um, you know, change the date or maybe I want to change the delivery time, something like that, or add an email to this, whatever. If I need to change anything, I can either select this pencil tool here, and that's how I edit the schedule, or I can hit the big button that says edit schedule, which is what I prefer to do. Okay. You also have the option to rerun this from the last schedule. Okay. I can run it right now rather than waiting for uh, the 30th of the month to see where we're at. I can create another schedule following this same schedule as a template. Right? So maybe I want multiple reports to follow the same pattern. I can schedule multiple reports, different reports, but following the same patterns, going to the same emails and all that good stuff. Okay. Of course, I can also delete it, which I will. But that is how I schedule reports, and that is reports overall. Now, I know, of course, we didn't have time to go through each of the reports, but it's actually quite simple. Just answer the few questions that it provides for you every single time you go to run the reports. Um, Donna's question, is there an agent not ready reason code report? Um, yes and no. Um, we've got this agent uh, reason, uh, reason code trace. Um, so this report will basically tell me what the feature type is. So if they put themselves on not ready or do not disturb, you might call it that. It'll say that here. So it would say not ready or do not disturb, and then it would give you the reason as to why. If you have our, in particular, if you have our agent dashboards, it'll give you the reason why, right? If you don't have agent dashboards, that's fine. It'll still give you uh, the, the, um, the not ready or do not disturb, okay? If, uh, again, in, in particular, if you have real time, okay? So those are a couple things that are required in order for us to use this report, but that, that's what I would use. Um, that's, that's probably the first one I, I would go to. Um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend. I mean, I, you can also use the agent real-time feature trace, that, that one that I showed a little bit earlier as well, because um, it'll kind of show you when they go on do not disturb again, for what reason, or, or not ready, for what reason, when it started, when it ended, and the overall duration, for each time that they did that, for the selected time, uh, time frame. Does that answer your question for you, Donna? Hopefully. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, perfect. You're welcome. Great. Any other questions before we move on to Cradle to Grave? Um, are you talking about this right here, Michael? Yes. Okay, yeah. Great question. So this is if you have our Vertex, uh, our Vertex uh, recording device. This is a manual pause record button. So if I am not set up to record automatically, now I'm, I'm set up to record automatically. I know that because uh, it shows a pause button here. If I'm not set up to record automatically, um, it would look like this. And if I'm on a call, if you want me to have this available, if I'm on a call and I think, you know what, oh, I should be recording this call. If a recording port is available, I can hit this button and it will start recording that call from that point, okay? Um, if I'm on a call, halfway through it, almost done with it, as long as I'm still on that call, 
and I think, you know what, I should have been recording this call from the beginning. Again, if I've got a recording, a port, uh, if there's a recording port available, I can actually hit this button and it will go back and record that call from the beginning if I wasn't set up to record automatically. Okay, so it's just, uh, it, you, you can pick and choose who you want to have access to this. If I want people to have access to it, I can. If not, I can I can take that away from them as well. I can, I can make it default to not see that. In other words, I can prohibit people from having access to that. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome, great question. Okay, any other questions? Cool, all right, well let's go ahead then and jump into Cradle to Grave. Now Cradle to Grave actually is kind of, and forgive me guys, we're, we're over on time here. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to recording library, but you guys have had such great questions, so thank you. I'm fine with it if you guys are. That's the way I'll put that there. If you, if you do need to leave, then I, I, I do completely understand. Um, I am recording this session, and so if you do want this session, you're welcome to send me a message and let me know. Um, I send it through what we call WeTransfer, I think is what it's called, and so you'll only have access to the recording for about seven days. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, is there a question? Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, can you listen to a live call? If you have Vertex, then yes. Um, and the way that I would do that, is under recording, if I have the recording library, and let me kind of also preface this, if you have updated to the most recent release of Chronicle, we haven't always had this available, this is fairly new, so if you have the most recent release of Chronicle, which is 310, um, then at that point, if you have the Vertex recording option, where it says view active recordings here, uh, actually, uh, uh, well, yeah, this is probably the best way to do it. So go to view active recordings, and I don't think my demonstration will allow me to show you this, um, but I can come in here and if, I, if, if there's a call I wanna to listen to, yeah, it's not gonna let me show you, but I can right click on the call that I wanna to listen to and it will give me the option to listen live, okay? Yeah. But that does require our Vertex and it does require the most recent release of Chronicle. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh -huh, you're welcome. Okay, all right, great questions. Any other questions? Okay, God, I am loving this, guys, great. All right, so let's uh, let's go ahead and do this. Um, let's jump into record. Uh, excuse me, to Cradle to Grave. As I mentioned, Cradle to Grave is really similar to the reports, but Cradle to Grave is the backbone of the reports. It ver uh, verifies or validates what the reports are telling you. And and I wanted to do this. Um, I'm going to go ahead really quickly. Come back here to uh, uh, my run reports, and I'm going to run this abandoned calls report really quickly because I want to use this in just a second here. Um, but really, overall, as I kind of mentioned, Cradle to Grave verifies what my reports are saying also weird name I'll totally I totally get like it sounds super weird I will explain why we call cradle to cra uh, cradle to grave cradle to grave okay and some of you might have heard that term before but I'm gonna run that that'll probably pop up here first in just a second but uh, running cradle to grave is very similar to running a report okay uh, there we go all right come back to that um, to do this, all I have to do is select my time frame, right? And this can be, again, any amount of time, uh, the entire month, the entire week, whatever I want to do. Let's just run it for the 10th, just for yesterday. And we will come back to these filters. There is one I'm going to set right now. And that's where here, right here where it says calls slash chats. If I wanted to see those chat messages, guys, I can just select chats and see those chat messages between my team. So if I if I wanted to see what Blake and Adam were talking about in that chat tool, um, I can run this for chats and it will allow me to see what those, those conversations were. For right now, I only care about calls, so I'm just gonna go ahead and select calls and then hit okay. From this point, that's the only filter I wanna use for now. I'll go ahead and hit execute. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to pull every single phone call that took place in my selected time frame, right? Starting, and it is chronological, starting with the oldest going to the newest, okay? So starting at the top, it'll start with my, my first call for that time frame, and then the bottom will show me the, the, the last time call for that time frame. Now, right now, I'm noticing I'm seeing 1,000 out of 3,559 calls. Here's my issue. I do have the ability to search through these calls, but if I'm searching for something, let's say for example, I'm using my quick search tool here. If I wanna see a specific call, let's take for example, and I'll just show you this really quick here. Uh, the abandoned calls report is what we refer to as a detailed report. And there's two reasons why I call it a detailed report. Number one is because each line represents its own call, okay? And this really quickly here is what we refer to as a call ID. It is not caller ID, it's not a phone number. That number correlates with this call in our database, okay? So I'll show you that in just a second. But 
uh, it's called a detailed report because it allows me to see details of that call. So for example, I can see that this abandoned call involved a, a caller or a user named Jan Welch, not a user, excuse me, a, a client named Jan Welch. I can see which number it was that she dialed, probably uh, a, an office phone number, right? Probably my 1-800 number to get in my office. And here's her phone number. From there, I can see that she went to the appointments group and the call was actually answered. It was answered by Matthew Sanders. The call ended, however, in a park event. Well, I wanna know more about that. So I'm gonna take this number, I'm gonna copy it, take it back over here to Cradle to Grave, and I can paste that in the quick search tool. My issue is this, if that call is not found on this page, this is what we get. Then I think, oh, well, that call didn't take place. Holy cow, we have a problem. The issue is that that call is most likely on another page. I look over here and I can see page one of four. Oh, there are four call or four pages of calls. So here's what I like to do. I click on that little hyperlink there where it says page one of four and it's gonna say records per page. How many calls do I want per page? There are 3,559. So I'm gonna go ahead and say 3,000. Well, in fact, you know, I'm just gonna say 4,000. I'll round it up nicely. There we go. And I'll just hit okay. What I've just done is I've now gone through and just put all calls on the same page. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, let's see if it, uh, <laughs> it's thinking about it. Um, what I wanna do now is I kinda wanna repaste that number. So it did take us to that call, but essentially here, all I did was paste that number here and it took me here to this call. So I can see, if I'm looking here back at this call here on the, on the abandoned calls report, GN Welch and Matthew Sanders. That was the caller and the user. If I go back to Chronicle, calling party, caller name, excuse me, caller name. I'm going to move this over here just like that. I can see GN Welch. Receiving party, Matthew Sanders. If I look at that again, it says that the final event right there was a park event. Going back to Chronicle one more time, what was the final event? It was a park event. Okay. So this is the other reason why we call that a detailed report because I can copy and paste that number, bring it over here to Chronicle, and it shows me the details of that call. This is actually a good reason as to why this is called cradle to grave. Cradle to grave allows me to see every call, yes, but not just that. It allows me to see every call with its details. What happened? When she called in, she went to the auto attendant for 40 seconds. That's your first initial message. Hey, if you want to talk to support, press three, whatever. Okay. So she was in the auto attendant for 40 seconds. From there, she selected the appointments group to whom it rang for 10 seconds. No one was available. So she went into the queue for the appointments group for four minutes and 43 seconds. We then had someone become available. However, it rang for a minute and three seconds. That's a really long time to ring. Matthew Sanders then answered. They spoke for one second. He then put her on park for two minutes and 15 seconds. She got tired of it, so she hung up. On Live Chronicle, it'll actually tell you who hung up first. It'll say either calling drop or receiving drop. Calling drop, if you want to know who the calling calling uh, drop was, look at calling, par, uh, calling party or caller name. Receiving drop, look at receiving party, and that will tell you who hung up first. Okay. So cradle to grave is just finite details. Uh, it's the cradle to grave, the beginning to end, birth to death, womb to tomb, whatever you want to call it. It's the beginning to end of every single phone call and every lifespan in between that phone call life, uh, lifespan or every event, excuse me, every event in, in between those lives, that lifespan, okay? So that's kind of just an initial look at Cradle to Grave. Are there any questions on this so far? Okay. Hi, Who I'm, I'm so hear? sorry. Yeah. Just, you're fine, no, you're, don't happy, apologize. Yeah. You're absolutely fine. No, you're good, go for it. So on the, where you are on the current screen, <clears throat> um, where it appears that the customer hung up or dropped mm -hmm. the call, what would happen, how would it show if Matthew hung up on the customer? How yeah, different so in this, look? yeah, that, that's a great question. Like I said, on Live Chronicle, it will show you this. On my demo, sometimes it shows it, sometimes it doesn't. But in this scenario, had Matthew hung up first, what it would actually say it would, it was, is right here where it says drop, it would say receiving drop. Okay, so if this was a live, a live, in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, the patient mm -hmm. received the drop. So no, the receiving party dropped oh, okay. it. And so Matthew's the yeah. receiving party. He Matthew dropped it. Yeah. Okay. Yep, correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So like I said, on live cross call, it actually shows that calling drop, if it was the caller who hung up first, receiving drop, yeah, if it was the receiver who hung up first. Okay, great question. Uh, any other questions? 
going to zoom in on this just a little bit here, make it a little bit easier to see. All right, now really quickly, one other thing I want to show you, of course, we use our quick search tool here, right? If I have a phone number or a name or something like that, if I just need to find something really quickly, you know, I can type that in here and it will take me directly to the call that's associated with that specific whatever it is I type here. Now, it's taking just a second to kind of show up there. But I typed in a phone number here so I can see here, here's that call. And it shows me that there's one one instance a one instance of out of 1,865. It's just taking a second to catch up there. There we go. So one instance of three, right? So I can see here. There's it says there's three instances of that number. If I look here, one, two, three. So it's very literal. It's going to say I see that number three times. It's going to show you that there's three instances of it. That doesn't mean there's three separate phone calls. It just says that it sees that three times, and it's right here. Okay, so you can type in anything here. Like I said, if you have that caller name or if you have that phone number, whatever it might be. Okay, but that's great and all. This is that it's not re it's not removing any other calls. It's just showing me the calls that fit that criteria. And if if you know if something does fit it, it takes me to that call, but it doesn't remove anything else. That's fine. But what if I want to find calls that have specific uh, that has specific information or specific events in it? Well, this happens a lot. I want to see, I want to come back here to where it says criteria, and then it's going to pop up with my chronic all cradle to gray features, uh, filters, excuse me. And I have, I have kind of several different kind of filters. I have general criteria. So if I want to search for calls for a specific user, now if I just select agent here, it's not going to be uh, prejudiced against what direction the call is, right? It's going to show me both inbound and outbound and internal calls, I should say, as well. But maybe there's, I, I just want to see calls where that user was the calling agent or that user was the receiving agent, right? For this purpose today, I'm going to use this agent option. Maybe I want to see all of those calls for Matthew Sanders. I know he had that hold or that, uh, uh, that call with that person um, where they hung up, right? But I want to see all of his calls. So I'm going to come here where it says user or users. I'm going to type in his name. Of course, I'm not always searching just for one name. If I know other people I want to search for, I can do the same thing. Just select, just type in their name and select them as well. So you can select as many users as you want. I just like to just type in their name here so I can get to the one I'm looking for in particular. So I've just selected Matthew Sanders, and I'll go ahead and hit OK. From there, I can also select event level filters. Event level filters are things like, you know what, I want to search for his calls to have a specific event that took place. Maybe I hear complaints about Matthew. Maybe I hear he puts people, you know, uh, maybe he has too long talking events or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and say talking. Okay, I want to make sure it's a call that actually has a talking event on there. So I've selected Matthew Sanders calls with a talking event. I'll go ahead and hit execute, and that will show us how many calls fit that criteria. Now, there's probably going to be a, a good amount for that time frame. 122 total. If you look here, receiving party. Matthew Sanders is all the way down, right? It's, it's Matthew Sanders for days. Then we have things like out, outbound calls. That's what these little purple arrows represent. It says outbound. I can see that this outbound call is made by Zachary Diaz. Uh, so we can see that information, right? That's good, but it's not specific enough. Let's come back to criteria again. So we've got Matthew Sanders, talking events selected. Well, I want this just to be for inbound calls. So I'm going to go ahead and select call direction, inbound. But not just that. I want to make sure that it's a talking event where that talking event is greater than or equal to three minutes, something like that. Okay. These are call level filters. Call level filters are more advanced, they're more specific. Right? I could even say things like, is that call abandoned? True. Now, I don't know if there are any um, with that specific criteria, so I'm not going to select that for now, but I could go through here. Is call abandoned? True. Is call recorded? True. Right? So you have all of these different options, of course, for time's sake, we're not going to go through all of those. But at that point, I can hit execute, and it will go through and only pull calls that fit that criteria. So 122 calls, 52 narrowed down. That's not a, a very good narrow. I mean, it's, you know, 100 or, you know, whatever, at least 75 calls less. But at this point, I can open this up, and I can see for every call, Matthew Sanders, inbound call, talking event greater than or equal to three minutes. Okay? Maybe I want to get more specific. Maybe I want to say greater than or equal to 10 minutes. 12 minutes, something like that. You can hit execute again, and it'll get a little narrowed down even further for us. Okay? So you can use those filters to find exactly what it is that you're looking for to make it easier for you. So you don't have to spin, you know, scroll through each one of those calls looking for that information. All I have to do is type in my criteria. Hey, this is what I want to see. Chronicle, this is what I'm looking for. And then from there, it provides me the calls that fit that specific criteria. And again, I can open those up and I can see Matthew Sanders, inbound call, talking event greater than or equal to 12 minutes. 
Matthew Bennett Sanders greater than or equal to 12 minutes, and so forth. Okay, so you can use that criteria to help you narrow down specifically to find the calls that you are looking for and most interested in. Okay, any questions about cradle to grave? Or any other, I should say. Okay, I do want to show you one last thing here. I'm going to go ahead and clear my my uh, my filters here. I don't have to deselect each one individually or anything like that. I don't have to exit out of Cradle to Grave. All I have to do is hit Delete, hit Yes, add filter, and again, I'm going to go ahead and add just calls again because I don't want to see those chats. But at this point, I can go ahead and hit Execute, and again, one more time, it'll only pull or it'll pull calls um, without those filters, I should say. Okay. So there we go. We're back to 3,559. Now there's one last filter I want to show you, and that's because I get asked about this frequently. And that is, can I see calls for specific phone numbers? Can I see a call to make sure that we called them back or to see if they actually called in? Yeah, any number that's not part of my phone system is called or is what we refer to as an external party or an external number. External numbers there are, are not numbers or not extensions essentially that belong to our phone system. Okay, so anything outside of our phone system is considered an external number. So right here where it says call includes external party. I'm gonna open this up. I'm gonna make sure it says include any. I can say equal personally. I like to do contains to give myself a margin of error, right? There just, just to be safe, a little safety net. But then at that point, I type in the phone number that I'm looking for. Now, I would always recommend don't put in any parentheses, don't put in spaces, don't put in dashes. Just type the number straight just like that. Hit okay and hit execute, and again, at that point, it'll go through and pull any phone number that fits that criteria. So here's that phone number right there, and we can see, there it is, and we can see the details for those calls. So we can see here, if they call and say, you guys never call me back, no, they're right, we didn't. Right? And granted, that was just for one day, so maybe I wanted to see you know, the past week. Hit execute, and again, same thing. We can, we can look for that number, and it'll show us how many instances of that number there were in that time frame that we selected. So that's Cradle to Grave. And again, I've gone already 10 minutes over and I still need to go through recording library. So I apologize about that, uh, but I've 100% appreciated your questions. So with that, are there any questions or are, any, are there any further questions? Okay, cool. Well, let's talk about re uh, recording library really quick. The great thing about recording library is it's a really, really simple tool to use, okay? Recording library is really in Cradle to Grave. Um, again, keep in mind it really does two things. The first thing it does is it compresses recordings, so it makes them smaller, right? So I can save more space. The second thing it does is as soon as that call is recorded, it's then made directly available for me to access to the Cradle to Grave interface. Now, personally, I'm going to come down here and say is call recorded. We'll go ahead and set that at true. And at this point, I'm going to come back up here and make sure that calls are selected and not chats. There we go. And then hit execute. So at this point, I want to see all calls that are recorded in that specific time frame. If it's recorded, it'll show up here in my list. Recording section right there. Okay. So if I, a call is recorded, all I have to do to listen to it is click on that play button. And at that point, it'll pop up with a little uh, media player down here at the bottom. I can listen to that recording. As I'm listening to it, there are a couple things I can do. Over here to the right hand side, we've got this little option that looks like a on that and it shows you what I have the options to do with this recording. Now of course this is all dependent on what I've been given permission to do when this account was created for me. If I'm a manager or if I'm an administrator I can do whatever I want with these recordings. Okay but if you've created a user account for me as I did for Tammy then at this point um, I will only be able to do again like I said what you've given me permission to do. So I can download this recording, I can email this recording, I can delete this recording. Those are the three main things that you've given me access to do. Generate external listen link is for those of you that want to send a recording to someone, but you don't want them to have permanent access to it. So if I need to send a recording to someone so they can hear it, I can generate an external listen link. That means I get to set days. That means if I only want them to access that recording for maybe, or for maybe three days, right? I'll go ahead and select three and then hit okay. My, my um, demo here won't allow me to do this all the way typically. Yeah, at that point it would generate a link that I could paste in an email, copy and paste in an email, send it to them, and they will be able to access that recording, but only for three days. After three days, that link turns off, and I will no longer be able to access that recording uh, as the person that, was, that received that recording. You always will be because it's part of Chronicle. It's, it's your recording, right? So there you have that. Okay, a few other options you have. Um, if I ever add notes to a call, 
can I add notes? Absolutely. If I'm listening to this recording and I want to keep track of something, I want to, I, you know, maybe right here, I hear something that took place and I want to keep track of that. So where it says view notes, I'm going to click right here. And I'm going to add a note at 31 seconds into that call. This is where it got scary, right? So whatever. So I can add that note, hit save. And I can hit close. So if I'm accessing this recording later on, um, I can see here that there's actually a little note here in the C2G note section. Okay, and I can see that note, and I can also, if there are multiple notes, because there might have been multiple notes added to here or added to this call, so I can open this up and say view notes, and it would show me all the notes that were added to this call. Okay, um, that's a great question, Michael. Again. Uh, quite, my, Michael's question, you, you probably don't see it, is what happens if a call is put on hold? Does the call continue to record all of the hold of the whole time? Um, if you're using Vertex, by default, yes, it records the entire call. Um, so you can have that ent entire call recorded so you can hear all the nasty things they say about you if you put them on hold. There is an option um, in your recording rules where you can have it just record just the talking events. Okay, um, so, um, you know, and I can, um, I think I can send you uh, an article about that uh, a little later on. But but at this point, you know, yeah, it will record everything by default. Otherwise, you can set a recording rule to just record talk events. Real quick question. Okay. Does it treat yeah. cool. the um, talking events as separate? Like if, if there was a transfer, is it all one call or will it break it up and be treated like separate calls for the recording? Yeah, that's a great, great question. It'll all be one call. Okay. Um, and so, so for example, here, here's one of them. I'll, I'll kind of show you here uh, with this call here. We can see that there are multiple talking events. Now, there's not a transfer event, um, but we would see any talking event would have its own specific play button that I could click on and just listen to just that event. Okay. okay. But yeah, it would it would feature them all as as the same phone call, just different separate talking events. Okay. So if I were to email that to somebody, it would be I wouldn't have to email three separate talking events, right? It would be one event. Right, yeah. So at this point, what I would recommend you're going to do, if if you are going to to email the recording, um, uh -huh. I would always just right click on the the initial button. So like okay. you'll notice here, yeah. So I would just right click on the initial button, and I would say, you know, email email as a WAV file or a .spx file. Um, but yeah, that that's what I would recommend doing. All right, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Great question. Okay, um, now. Just a couple more things here. Of course, as I mentioned, you could add notes. You can also create a snippet, right? And this actually might be really helpful for you, uh, 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 Michael. If, if there was only a portion of that call I wanted to send, I can actually create a snippet. And that basically means I can come in here and say, okay, just this portion right here. Right? This is all I want them to have access to listen to. So at that point, I could download it, and then I'd have the option to email it as well. Right, so you can create snippets. So if you're like, okay, the rest of the call doesn't matter, this is the portion that matters most, then you can of course create that snippet and email that snippet or download that snippet, whatever you need to do. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and close that there and we'll do this one last time. There's one last thing I'll show you. That is for these really long calls, right? Maybe this call is 25 minutes, 30 minutes of talking. It was the for eight. Nobody got time for that, right? So I can go ahead and hit playback speed, and I can actually change the speed. Now, when you do this, if I put this at 2.0, that speeds it up by uh, times two, um, but it doesn't make them sound like chipmunks, right? They're, they're going to be able to hear the whole recording, um, but it's going to be sped up in their normal voice. Okay. Same thing if I slow it down. Maybe I want to, you know, maybe they said something and I didn't quite catch what that was. So I want to slow it down so I can I can slow that speed down so I can I can hear that in slow motion. Um, but again, it's not going to make them sound like you know. Uh, uh, What's his name? Um, Andre the Giant, right? When he's talking to Prince Bride. Anyway, so that's that's uh, that's a nice feature there as well. So those are just a couple things that you have access to now with the recording. This isn't something we've always had access to. This is something that we've recently released. So, um, yeah, there you go. Any any questions about that? There is one last major thing I want to show you with the recording library. Um, if you don't mind giving me the time here, but uh, any other questions about this? Okay, last major thing. We're going to see an option here. See if I can pull this over here. Come on. Oh, of course, it's going to be stingy. Uh, let's see if I can access it. There it is right there. Okay. One of the other things you have access to do with Recording Library is you can create what we call a scorecard campaign. Now, a campaign, basically what was going on is we had people telling us, hey, we really, really like Recording Library because we can access those recordings really easily through Cradle to Grave. Nice. 
But over here on my other screen, maybe I have a, on my other monitor, I have like a, an Excel spreadsheet where I have some questions that I want to use to evaluate their performance. We really, we really like that idea. So we took it and we actually implemented that into Chronicle. So if I go to the Chronicle main menu under recording, there's an option called score recording. This allows me at this point to go through and create my own campaign, create a list of questions that I want to use to evaluate the performance. So all I have to do to do that is hit here where it says create new campaign. Now I have two options. I can do this for either groups or for agents. I'm going to stick with groups today because it's a little less, it takes a little less time. Let's go ahead and hit OK here. And at that point, it's going to open up with some parameters that it wants me to answer, or so some things that it wants me to fill out. Um, as long as this will will speed up. Come on, kids, we got this. Come on. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, so here we have the option now to name what I want this to be. I'm going to go ahead and just call this Tammy's campaign. I don't think she's here anymore, but we'll go ahead and do it anyway. And Tammy's campaign, uh, we get to select a start date. This is really cool. I can be back in the past. You know, maybe I've had my recordings now happening for two months. All right, cool. Let's go back to the beginning of July. Maybe that's when they started. So I'm going to go ahead and select the first or the second of July. I can select the first. That's fine. And then hit OK. That means it's going to be able to record, uh, provide recordings from me from that point. Okay, so depending on what I select to do here, depending on what kind of my end goal is, I have the option to see in the past here. I also have the option to add an expiration date if I want to. I don't have to. Maybe this is something I want ongoing. Maybe I want this to, to use this as an evaluation tool at all times. Or maybe it's during a probation period. Maybe someone's got their first three months, right? And I want to make sure that during those first three months, they're performing pro appropriately, right? So I can go three months and put it at, the, you know, end that at three months, whatever I want to do. For today's purposes, I'm not going to go ahead and put an expiration date, but you, you can if you want to. As this is a group campaign, I want to select which group or groups I want this to, to provide recordings for. So I'm going to go ahead and select appointments group, hit OK. And now it's going to say, well, how many of those calls do you want to score? So I could do this by a certain amount of calls. So I could say 30 calls. Now, if this is ongoing, it'll be 30 random calls out of 100. So every out of every 100 calls, 30 of them will be provided for me to, to use in this, in this process. I'd rather do this by percent. I'm going to go ahead and say 5% of their calls I want to be able to score. Okay, there we go. Great. Now, at this point, all I have to do is add my questions. Okay, so questions, question text, question type. Here's add. I have three options. I have yes or no. Is this a yes or no question? You guys are going to be a lot more creative this than I am, with this than I am. So yes or no, okay? There's question number one. Number two is, on a scale of one to ten, uh, one to ten, how one to ten is it? Okay, scale of one to ten. Great. Last one or last type of question is a text question. And I'll just say note, sla note slash comment. There we go. So those are my questions. Like I said, you guys are going to be more creative with this. You, you can add as many as you want to that. From there, I could hit OK and honestly be done. But um, I think it actually makes you hit Add Filter here. So just keep that in mind for some reason. I noticed that today as I was kind of playing around with this. So you have to hit Add Filter here, but you don't actually have to add filters. Okay. There's two other things this allows me to do kind of while that's waiting. The first is this. I can create some campaign permissions. By default, only manager accounts and administrator accounts to Chronicle have access to this campaign. However, if I've created a user account for someone, let's say, for example, Daniel is one of my users. He only has access to a certain group of people, and maybe he is over the appointments group. Maybe he's a supervisor under Tammy. So at that point, I want him to be able to get in here and help me with this. So I'm going to go ahead and select Daniel. That means Daniel now has access to this, this campaign, and he can get in here, listen to the recordings, and help me score these calls. Otherwise, it would just be administrators and managers that have access to this. Okay. Now with these filters, this is actually really nice because there are a lot of times where I want to make sure that I'm only getting calls provided to me that are recorded that have specific events that take place. For example, coming here where it says event type, I want to make sure that this actually has a talking event on it. Because kind of like uh, Michael's question earlier, is it going to provide me recording, or is it going to, uh, will Vertex, for example, or does Chronicle record the call even hold events? Yeah. Let's say, for example, that this call just has a queue event on it, and it recorded it. I don't want that. That doesn't provide me any value. So I want to make sure that that call actually has a talking event on it. But not just that, for example, maybe I want to make sure that that talking event is at least a certain amount of time, else again, it might not provide any value. So I'm going to go ahead and say anything greater than five minutes. So at that point, I can hit OK, and it would then go through and create 
that a campaign for me. Of course it didn't, because this is just my demo here. That's really helpful. But at that point, I could then score those recordings. And as I score them, what would happen is that's going to log within Chronicle. It's going to remember those scores that I gave to someone through one of those campaigns. And at that point in our standard reports uh, uh, module, we have what we call campaign reports. So if you see the word campaign next to it, it's a report that I can use to report on those campaigns, on those scorecards. Now this isn't the one I would use because that's the agent scorecard. I haven't done an agent scorecard. Uh, I've done a group one, so I can come here where it says group scorecard summary, and I would be able to use this one. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to use it because I haven't done that group or that agent one yet. Right? So now I can run this report and actually provide information, provide uh, statistics and, and, and proof when it comes to those evaluations. I can show them how they're performing based upon those recording campaigns. Now, in Cradle to Grave, one last thing I'll say, in scoring status, if a call belongs to a recording uh, a campaign, it will show here if it has been graded or not. If it has not, you can grade those call recording or those scorecards directly through the Cradle to Grave interface. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. That's a long time. Any questions about this? Okay. Any questions about anything else we've discussed today? Okay. Guys, I've gone a half o half hour over. I do apologize, but I've it's you know your questions have been so great, and I, I hope that this has been helpful. Um, otherwise, let us know if we if if you do have further questions. Uh, of course, have access to that documentation guide. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your questions. But uh, everybody, have yourselves a fantastic day.